Welcome everybody uh, to the Central European University. This is the final event of our conference, a two days conference on the theme of digging together in diversity. Uh, my name is Marco Antonsic, uh, I'm a professor here at the Central European University and uh, uh, with Tatiana Mateiskova, I'm the main organizer of the conference. Uh, the purpose of this roundtable tonight is to reflect after two days of conference on the very theme of living together in diversity. And by this theme we mean how uh, diverse people, uh, how diverse national societies manage to live together. Uh, oftentimes, as I mentioned, uh, we hear that diversity, or to use a more value-loaded term, difference, is associated with issues of exclusion, marginalization, discrimination. The purpose of this conference, although we acknowledge the importance of these issues, is not to see what, how diversity is excluded, but how it can be included. Uh, it's about to understand how togetherness in diversity is imagined is practiced, is lived, is narrated. And tonight I'm particularly pleased uh, to introduce to you two uh, four uh, well-known uh, geographers. Uh, maybe I should apologize because we are talking about a conference in diversity and the panel is not very diverse in terms of the gender <laughs> uh, point of view, but I'm sure we'll be compensated from questions, uh, questions from the audience. So, uh, let me then start introducing our speaker. Uh, the first speaker, the one on my left, is uh, Dr. Patricia Erkamp, Associate Professor at the University of Kentucky. Her research is informed by ethnographical work in Germany and the United States, and revolves around four major issues. Feeling of home and belonging among migrants, political and public discourses of migrant assimilation, geographies of citizenship in the context of migrant transnationalism, and religion and secularism. On her left is Professor Eleanor Kaufman from Middlesex University in London. She's the co-director of the Social Policy Research Center at the same university. She has published extensively on issues of citizenship and migration, and more specifically on family, gender, and labor migration in Europe, as well as discrimination. On her left is Professor Helga Leitner, who is our next panelist. Uh, Professor Leitner is from the University of Minnesota, She's an urban and political geographer who has also published extensively on issues of immigrant incorporation and activism and the policies of citizenship and belonging. Last but certainly not least, Professor Jill Valentine from the University of Leeds. She's an influential author on issues of social identities, citizenship and belonging, among others. And more recently, she has been the recipient of an important grant from the European Research Council for a project which also aims to study how to generate capacity to live with difference. So without further ado, I would uh, uh, hand it over to Patricia. Let me uh, mention that each speaker will have about 10 minutes uh, to uh, reflect on the theme of the conference, and then we will open the floor uh, to the audience. So to Patricia. Thank you, Marco, and thanks to all of you who are sticking around and not running off to drinks and dinner right away. So um, we're pleased that we still have people to talk to and hope that we're going to have a lively discussion. If the last two days of the conference are an indication, I think we will. But before I um, answer the question that Marco posed, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Marco and Tatiana for all the work that they have done to put together a really interesting conference. And so we should probably give them a big round of applause. <laughs> because after all, they brought all of us here together <laughs> to have together in, in rather diverse and uh, interesting conversations. So now, <laughs> the more serious business. So Marco gave us the charge to um, think about what might keep societies together 
in the multicultural age, and he specifically asked this panel um, to address the national scale and, and whether or not it's important or its importance. Now, that first and foremost raises the question of what do we mean by the national? Do we mean the nation state? Very often when we talk about the national, we assume that there is a nation state um, which happens to be the dominant organizing principle, territorial organizing principle in the world. Um, possibly the nation state is a site of identification. But then we've also heard throughout um, these past two days that there are different types of nationalisms and national identifications. Um, Tariq Modud yesterday talked about Britishness. But then we've also heard the idea of Scottish, English, and uh, Welsh nationalisms, even with, within Britain. Um, we have Basque nationalism in Spain, and so forth. So given some of these complexities, then why do we want to privilege the national? And, and here I return to the idea of the na national state or the nation state. So why should we privilege the national when we talk about diversity, difference, and living together? And here I must admit it's probably no secret actually that um, I'm a little bit skeptical about privileging the national. At the very least, there's a need to connect the national to other spatialities and to other processes that are local, urban, or transnational, or all of the above together. So to think about the national then makes sense though because the national level is important in the sense that it uh, is there where a lot of important policies are being decided. These policies in turn set the context for what type of diversities and what type of differences are, um, are possible, are allowed, or um, are imaginable. And the national in that sense also affects other specialities. To take an example then from the German, um, from Germany, very often the task of managing diversity, shaping diversity, or containing difference is, um, takes place at the national level. The German Conference on Islam is one such example of an institution that seeks to um, shape uh, religious difference or religious um, conformity. The Conference on Islam is um, convened by Germany's Minister of the Interior, and it's made up of various Muslim um, organizations, a number of Christian church organizations, and some secular groups. But it also occasionally um, includes self-declared public advocates of uh, migrant women, advocates that are deeply anti-Islamic. And so there is within this very conference um, the notion of, of disciplining Islam in particular ways uh, and, and also conflict within this conference contained. What it is supposed to do, I argue, is to integrate Islam and integrate Islam in ways that are supposed to provide guidance as to what type of Islam is desirable. And in that sense, um, the national institution is trying to normalize Islam in as it tries to work out an Islam that's palatable to the German secular um, state. Now, that's of course not unique to Germany because we have similar institutions as we heard yesterday um, in France. In Britain, the government seeks to strengthen um, moderate Muslim groups by supporting them. And uh, so we have a number of ways in which states are using their power to try and, and create institutions that they're able to talk to rather than talking to a diversity of institutions. And on the other hand, it might actually be beneficial for Muslims, for other religious groups to have a national platform for um, Jews in France that, that is an important um, part as uh, a paper yesterday was um, talking about, the only question then that remains, why is there no council on Christianity? So that's one thing that we don't see in, in a number of these. And when we're talking about diversity and taking diversity and managing it, taking that idea seriously, why are we only managing one type of religious diversity or difference and, and not all of them? 
And then even if we concede that the national state does a lot, or national institutions, national level institutions, are doing a lot to set the politi policy context um, at the national level, there's then still a lot of ways, a lot of difference in the ways in which religion is actually practiced and understood in people's everyday lives in the cities and, and neighborhoods where they live. And there's also a lot of um, differentiation in the ways in which this type of practice may be um, claimed, expressed, and contested at the national level by those who disagree with certain religious practices. How else might we explain that in German, the German Bundestag, the German government, um, asserts the constitutional right to places of worship at the federal level, at the national scale, but that local residents, right-wing parties, and public intellectuals are able to claim that Muslims should not have the right to build mosques, or if they have to build mosques, uh, to please omit the minaret. So all of this is to say that while the national matters, it does not determine the everyday lives and practices of different people. And if we do talk about migrants, we also need to think about them as, as not having just local or national lives, but lives that are deeply connected to places outside of a particular nation state, um, connected to one or two other states. So, and the same holds true for religious institutions that are deeply transnational themselves. And that holds both for um, a number of Islamic organizations, but also for such institutions as the Catholic Church. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Patricia. Um, then, Professor Kaufman. Um, well, I want to um, take forward uh, a little bit something that Patricia said at the beginning. And I thought, oh my God, you're going to say what I was going to say. <laughs> um, that's not fair. But um, I want to take it further. And this is this question of what do we mean by the national? Um, because yesterday Tariq spoke about um, Britishness, but as he was speaking, I was thinking, but hold on a moment, we have different conceptions of what is the national, particularly in what I think was in a paper this afternoon called In States Which Have Nationally con Contested States, or where the national is contested in a state. And if you go through um, certainly European states, you see there are a lot of nationally contested states. It's not a, a minority situation. So what I'm talking about here is where we actually have sub-state nationalist movements would be one category, for example, Belgium, Spain, UK, just to name a few. We have others where uh, you have very strong linguistic um, differences, as it is the Swiss case, um, particularly between French speakers, uh, German speakers, but then divided again along cantonal lines. Um, and you might ask, well, what's the, what's the problem here? Well, the problem is obviously because we're not talking about a singular national. We're talking about a plural, plurality of nationals. And in terms of uh, the question of to what do you belong, um, this plurality of nationals can be very significant. Because it's significant both in the ways that uh, individuals and other groups feel that they belong. So for example, it could, it could be the Scottish or the Welsh or the English, which we didn't talk about yesterday. And yet, in the British case, there is a lot of toing and froing. There's been a huge amount of discussion in the last 10 years about English versus British, in the sense that the English is often seen to be more racist. So why do migrants, um, particularly racialized migrants, do not want to see, do not want to belong to the English, because it seems as being more white? So the question is, what do, e what do these nation nations actually signify for outsiders, and I think this is extremely important. But this is also linked not just because it's a matter of fluid, you know, you choose which nation you want to belong, but that these nations also have a lot of power. The sub-state in particular in certain cases have a lot of power in terms of shaping identities within them. I'm thinking here again, just listening to the, pre the last talk in the previous session in this room, which was about the Flemish versus the Catalans. And both of these sub-state nationalisms actually have a lot of political clout 
in terms of shaping identities of those who come into those nation states. So I think it's important to think about um, the different kinds of nations uh, and the way in which um, nations actually um, are able to shape, and on the one hand, uh, the identities and the sense of belonging of those who come in as migrants, but secondly, um, the way in which uh, migrants both settled, who may often be citizens and have been there since the 50s and 60s, as well as recent migrants, actually feel that they belong because um, one uh, national identity may feel to them more inimical to uh, their sense of belonging, the sense of if they're being more racialized in one kind by one nation than than another. So I think this is something um, to me which is a very important issue, because one of the things that I did want to say yesterday that I didn't get a chance, but I thought I'll save this up, was that uh, we have to remember that multiculturalism did not start with migration. Um, if you think about the Canadian case, we have uh, multiculturalism actually started with bicultural Canada. Um, and so it was the relationship between the English-speaking bloc and the French-speaking bloc, which in a sense Kim Kimlick is going back to. We also have another group that we have completely ignored, and that is indigenous peoples, who are also very important in being brought into uh, forms of multiculturalism and what does it mean to live in diversity and these are the two groups whom we've talked about much less than migrants actually politically have got far more rights in the in in those settler societies because quite often the rights that they've struggled for are down in the constitution um, you know if you think about French speakers in Canada or Aboriginal people and so on so I think we need to we sh when we're talking about living in a multicultural age, we need to think about diverse kinds of multiculturalisms. And the fact that the rights that are ascribed to the different multiculturalisms may be quite different. Some may be very strong, and others are actually very weak, and may be being pushed into a more assimilationist um, uh, kind of position, as we many of us have discussed in relation to what's been happening, particularly in Europe in the last decade. So that was one major point that I wanted to make. The other, which is linked to this, is again this issue of a diversity of forms of difference um, when we're talking about the kinds of societies that we're living in. Um, so that it isn't again just about migration, it's the fact that migrants themselves have different characteristics um, that may Bring that may, there may be identities that have nothing to do with migration per se. I'm thinking here of something that I talked about yesterday, which is the whole question but of gender, of sexuality, of disability, of age. Um, all of these are important social divisions within society which don't just apply to migrants, they also apply to the whole of the population. And I think when we talk about the kind of societies we're living in, um, we need to, t to bear in mind uh, that within each of these social divisions, there are actually also then other divisions within them. Now, I'm, I think um, Jill's going to probably talk a little bit more about intersectionality, because I think that's how we divided it. But I just wanted to say here that you have both, on the one hand, uh, especially in, in, for example, in gender terms, whereby um, there may be a gr great deal of simplification about uh, the differences between migrant women uh, and between migrant men as well. But both migrant women and migrant women, uh, mi migrant men are divided by skills, they're divided by uh, age, uh, they're divided by educational level, and yet politically we find that quite often these differences are simplified on the one hand, and they deny the reality of these differences within the groups. And these are very important if we think about um, the notion of diversity within contemporary societies. Um, and I just want to end here also to say that, again, within each of these groups, we may have opposing, we may actually have conflicts between these groups. So I'm thinking here of, uh, uh, a, a, an Equality and Human Rights Commission study that I participated in, um, which was looking, which was 
called about good, which was called good relations, and precisely it was about how do people live with each other, under what terms, what do they think about each other, and interestingly enough, precisely um, the two groups that um, were the most discriminated were those with disabilities, both. Um, mental health issues, but also particularly physical disabilities, as well as the Roma. But again, within each of these groups, it wasn't that they were uniform or unified, because within, um, for example, within the traveller groups, uh, we found there was a huge amount of homophobia. So I think we need to think about groups themselves as being diversified. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to think about society as being completely fragmented, which I think some of us is a critique of a lot of postmodernist thinking. But nevertheless, I think we do need to take that into account in thinking about uh, the title of the, this conference, and that is living together in diversity within, a multicultural, within multicultural societies. So what I'm trying to say is there are a variety of diversities, but, uh, and they aren't just reduced, of course, to the diversity that migrants bring into a society, because this is what we've largely been, I think, talking about in the last two days. What I'm trying to suggest is there are other diversities and that, that migrants themselves partake of those other diversities at the same time. And, and the question then, and I'm going to leave my other two colleagues maybe to think about it, is how do we pull them together a little bit more? You know? okay. Thank you, Professor Helga Leitner, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to make four points today. The first two points are response to uh, Marco's charge, namely, we should focus in here in, at this conference on the here and now and the national scale. And so my first point is on temporality. Um, I would suggest, and this I, I would consider this actually as something, a point for discussion, but also perhaps a friendly amendment uh, to Marcus' charge of focusing on the present. Because I would suggest that the present um, uh, and the future, as well as the past, are intricately related with one another. Indeed, I would go even further to suggest that the past and the future are crucial in understanding the present. And let me give you, uh, make a, a, a case for that. How individuals and group relate to one another in the here and now is always about also the past and the future. In other words, how we see ourselves living together and how we live together in the present is influenced by past relations with the other. In the US, for example, you cannot understand contemporary race relations without the history of slavery. Uh, now, how does the future figure into it? Um, in terms of how non-migrants relate to new immigrants is influenced by expectations and fears about the future living together. So the fear of losing, in, in, the, in the US, very, very important, the fear of losing white dominance. And it's this which actually fuels hostility towards uh, non-white immigrants. So in other words, we cannot uh, know and think about the present without the past and the future. In terms of spatiality, Patricia already took a lot of the steam here out of it. So, but one thing which I wanted to mention, and this is that if we think about the local, um, the national, the regional, and the global. Uh, I think what is important is never to think about them as separate, but really, I think as, as Jill already suggested the other day in a response, but rather how they are related. Think about it, the local, what happens at the local, is never simply just local. It's always, since the local is embedded in the national and the global. So uh, this is why I'm, I think, again, I agree with Patricia is, not to really, uh, I think, why we shouldn't necessarily actually privilege uh, the uh, national. And I would argue the papers throughout the conference have actually all made this point. So it's not just, I'm just sort of summarizing it, but I would argue the papers have made that point. The other two points I'm trying to make is that, um, or I made one already, uh, uh, during uh, when I gave my presentation, and this is the issue of really uh, taking serious that there is actually no uh, one national identity. Uh, there are multiple identities, and in particular, there. Uh, but what I'd like to point out now is uh, what we know from actually research 
in the United States, extensive survey research, and then also my own research is that. What is really interesting, in the US, there is no question, everybody acknowledges that the US is a multicultural, multiracial society. And I would argue, probably you could find the same in Germany. So, so somehow, you, they can't ignore anymore, because they, they, people are present, and they, they live, many of them live with them side by side. But what is the interesting thing is that this doesn't mean that actually people really, the, the kind of imaginary they have of the nation really is also actually a multicultural imaginary. And if you remember, I was making the argument what we are seeing in the United States is this sort of actually really conflicting imaginaries of a multicultural America, which actually is more close to what the reality looks like. Um, that values cultural diversity and conceives of America as an open and constantly emerging uh, uh, nation and place. And that's important. It's, it's not just open, but it's emerging. Yeah? And then a monocultural America that values cultural homogeneity and conceives of America as a social space and territory with clear boundaries. And it's important to note that this monocultural America is conceived uh, at least um, from the research I have done, primarily as a white anger America, actually conti continuing the long tradition of a racialized national identity in the United States. And uh, I, uh, I could show you actually some figures from surveys, national surveys, and the country is split right in the middle, 50-50 almost, in terms of this imaginary. Um, so, and I mentioned already these intense struggles which have ensued, which imaginary gets to dominate. And I think really important what we need to look in, in greater depth is actually, uh, and to really better understand who can determine who belongs and, uh, and also, and who does not belong. And um, I would argue here we need to go not just, we, we, we might uh, sort of design this as an extended case study almost. We might look at sort of the, from the micropolitics up to sort of national and international forces. Namely, the, we want to look at the broader relationships of power. These might include the power dynamics uh, and order of globalizing capitalist social relations and state structures, as well as social and racial hierarchies, down to the sort of then very uh, everyday interactions. Now, I want to close off, and this is something which. Um, actually is also very uh, dear to my heart is, uh, it's always part of my research. I'm thinking, okay, uh, now I've finished my research, I'm, I've, at least I think I better understand what I try to understand, but what, what actually, what, can, what should be done? Or what can I do also to contribute to this? So my last point is about what I call ethical, political interventions. And I would argue, and I've argued actually uh, in some writing, that in, in the US there remains a need for intervention that seek to break down racial stereotypes and racism <coughs> and deeply held notions of a white America. But also I think what is really important, one needs to take serious and not just always sort of discount uh, the fear of uh, fear and anxiety about large parts of, of white America. Uh, in the light of increasing sort of immigration. And however, I would argue, and this is where sort of I've tried to really to intervene, is that thus far, at least at the local level, a lot of the initiatives and policies have focused so much just on simply promoting cultural diversity, celebrating uh, cross-cultural communication, but have not uh, actually uh, addressed some of these issues which I just mentioned. Finally, however, uh, I also I would suggest it's not simply sufficient to really intervene at the local. As Leonid Sandokov already in 2003 suggested, it is necessary to go beyond the local, to, pre to replace sort of dominant, she calls them assimilationist, which would be sort of the monocultural uh, conception of the nation uh, with difference. Uh, and what she suggests is actually to replace this with a model of intercultural coexistence. And um, some of you might be familiar with it. I, I think it's, it's idealized, but I think you always need ideals to strive towards. Intercultural uh, coexistence requires knowledge of and willingness to learn from and recognize value in the other. 
which necessitates moving away from defining national and local belonging based on race and ethnicity towards a belonging based in a shared commitment to political community. In other words, actually a civic national identity. It also, this is very important, it demands a willingness to address prevailing inequalities of political and economic power and to negotiate actually fears of the other, as I mentioned before. And I'll turn it over with this to... <laughs> Um, thank you, Professor Lachner, <laughs> then uh, Professor Jill Valentine, thank you. Thank you. Well, I um, have both uh, the privilege of going last, which I think gives me uh, you know, a chance to have heard uh, the comments of my colleagues, but also the disadvantage in the sense that <laughs> three such wise scholars have already uh, kind of made many of the, the kind of points that, uh, um, and, I, and I share many, many of their, their kind of views and arguments. Because of Marco's uh, insistence on the lens of the national, I want to say a bit something at the beginning about the national, which is, I guess, a different take on some of the points that have already been made. But then I also want to go on to talk more specifically about how we develop the capacity to live with difference and move away from, from the national um, framing. So, um, as a geographer, like my colleagues here, I recognise, obviously, that in different national contexts, um, recognition of xenophobia, prejudice, various isms, racism, disabilism, homophobia and so on. They were different, you know, and acting in different ways, use of language to talk about them and so on. But I think it's also important to recognise that the national doesn't exist in isolation. And I've been working recently with some colleagues in Leeds on a, a project about homosexuality and global faith networks. Mm. Um, focusing specifically on the Anglican Communion um, as a transnational global faith network. And on the one hand, we've been looking at national contexts and we've been looking at the debate about homosexuality in the Anglican Communion in four different national nodes, the UK, the US, South Africa and Uganda. But we've also understood these as nodes in a wider global faith network in which we've looked at how homosexuality is conceptualised in each national node, but not in isolation, and how the, uh, those ideas about homosexuality and homophobia get mobilised and circulated between places through transnational practices, through circulation of resources, circulation of discourses, circulation of people, international gatherings, and, and, and so on. And in particular, how both the progressive and conservative positions in relation to homosexuality that get articulated by national churches also get translated into the everyday lives of lesbian and gay parishioners, where again, they're, they're interpreted and resisted in different ways because of the very specific different local contexts and as um, uh, Helga was just saying, in terms of their different local histories and, and different lo local cultures. So in this sense, I think, you know, coming some of the comments about the national have been made, that it's important not to reify the national, not to think of it in isolation, mm -hmm. but to understand it as uh, the relational nature of mm -hmm. scale and the mutual constitution of the, the national with the local, the global, and so on. So that's pay tribute to Marco's uh, focus on the national. It's <laughs> to move away from that, to think about the broader question of how we might live with, with difference, sort of separating it from specifically the national context. Um, and obviously, as I talked about earlier in my presentation, there's been, and many people have talked about in other papers over the last two days, recent work on cosmopolitanism and uh, geographies of encounters within the social sciences has suggested that we can live with difference, and it's been evidenced through um, uh, various bits of work that you know there are banal positive encounters between uh, different uh, individuals and different groups in public space where people can separate out potentially their um, beliefs uh, about others from their actual conduct. So for example, I did a study recently um, on prejudice and one of our interviewees was um, a very, had very right-wing political views, he was a supporter of the British National Party, you know, he was very kind of racist and xenophobic. But on the other hand, he lived next door to um, a refugee and every, day, uh, every Sunday they washed their cars together. And so he could separate out, if you like, his abstract um, his, his racism from his ability to have this, uh, this banal everyday civil encounter with, with his neighbour. And when I've sort of spoken about some of these, uh, this, these examples of how people can separate out their, um, their prejudices, if you like, from their, um, uh, from their everyday civil encounters, people have said, well, to me in, in questions after papers, well, isn't that enough? You know, isn't that the best we can hope for, mm -hmm. that people can set aside their prejudices in their actual encounters in public space? And that's the best we can hope 
to achieve. Um, but I actually want to problematise that because I think it, in doing so, it just if we take that approach, it will be really focusing really on the recognition of diversity, but not on the material, um, uh, uh, the material nature or significance of difference, and not on the question of the operation of power. Um, mm -hmm. Rather, I'm more interested in trying to trouble and, and unpack um, the notion of prejudice. And like Eleanor and some of the other speakers in, in some of the papers, I'm interested in the intersection of different forms of power and oppression. So how do, do homophobia, disablism, racism, Islamophobia and so on enforce each other or mobilise each other? Or when do they sometimes cancel each other out or undo each other? So I'm interested in, in intersectionality in relation to, 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 to prejudice. Um, and, and more broadly in terms of prejudice, I think the literature has always constructed um, individuals as either members of in-groups or as members of out-groups, as members of minorities or majorities. But then again, in my own work, I want to problematise this kind of simplistic or binary way of thinking and to recognise that for, for most of us we're positioned in multiple ways um, in, in relation to um, our kind of complex and, and multiple intersecting identities. So for many of us, sometimes we are positioned as privileged and, we, and in the majority, but also many of us have a, a lived experience of, of difference in marginalisation. And I gave an example in my paper this morning of a, um, of a white um, working class man who in many ways is a white heterosexual man, occupies some positions of privilege, but on the other hand also uh, experienced in his own everyday lived experiences of um, marginalisation both of his class but also because he had tattoos and body piercings. So in other words, I think we all have the capacity to hurt, but we also have the capacity to be hurt. And I'm interested in finding ways to address, you know, how we can unpack some of this complexity. Um, and so, um, in particular, I've been inspired recently, and actually Helga reminded me of this yesterday, but um, of Nira Yuval Davis's work um, on, on diversity, and particularly her notion of transversal politics, which she credits um, with originating from the work of Italian feminists in Bologna. And this is an intergroup strategy to work through um, conflictual relationships that also prom problematizes the homogeneity and the universalization of the experience. And it's a form of kind of alliance or dialogical politics that acknowledges firstly our situated nature of our identities and politics, but it also recognises the possibility that we can understand across difference and create common reference points for political strategies and provide support across categorical boundaries through um, a mutual questioning of the operation of, of, of power despite our different positionings uh, in relation to, to these categories. And in that sense it's a kind of feminist version of restorative justice. Mm -hmm. So in concluding, I think in, in highlighting this way of theorising it and, and um, thinking about difference. I also want to emphasise the importance of contribution of feminist uh, scholars and feminist work to debate about difference. And I think many of the reflections of geographies of cosmopolitanism mm -hmm. and geographies of encounters um, are likely often the feminist contribution to some of these ways of thinking yet gets overlooked or marginalised. Thank you, Professor Valentine. Um, let me make just a few remarks before opening the floor to the to the audience. Uh, I wonder whether I should be, as a co-organizer with Tatiana, uh, more concerned for the friendly remarks about <laughs> the theme and the particularly one dimension of the conference or the national, or just be happy because actually exactly this uh, theme uh, triggers such a lively reaction, very informative. So thank you for your own contributions. Uh, let me just spend a few words at least to justify and clarify what uh, uh, the national was understood when we put up this conference. So it's not understood in terms of a commonality, in terms of a national identity, but in terms of geographical scale, so the scale at which the state is organized. And I would argue that despite the fact that, yes, there is a, uh, obviously everyday life takes place at the local scale, and then you have this connectivity with a plurality of scales. So as Professor Valentine just mentioned, the mutual uh, co co production of scales, each scale is interrelated. Still, I do believe that the national scale is often overlooked. And the purpose was the, of the conference was very much to bring the national scale back in, not just as a mere regressive uh, uh, space where the lives of the people are constrained, but 
also look from the positive side because issues of, let's say, notion of social justice redistribution are exactly organized at a national scale. And these are very important, relevant issues for the everyday lives of people as well. Uh, I think this would go and lead towards uh, another topic for another conference, whether boundaries are needed or not needed in order to justify issues or redistribution or not. I'm going to stop here and open the floor uh, for questions, remarks, and comments. Since we are, bit, I'm sure there is a, a bit of two days intense work. Uh, but if you have any reaction to what has been said, uh, it would be very much appreciated. Also in terms of pushing the reflection forward on this topic, uh, also for uh, the uh, purpose of the video recording, so it would be useful to extend <laughs> the discussion. So I would really appreciate question from the audience. Uh, may I say something? Actually, I, I. Marco, uh, we were talking with Marco uh, last night, and we were trying to convince him that actually we should have the whole uh, group being actually involved in this sort of concluding section. And everybody actually see uh, uh, getting a chance to respond and to uh, voice their ideas in terms of what, uh, what they learned or what they sort of uh, uh, take away with or how they interpreted Marco's. <laughs> charge. Yeah. And so I was wondering actually uh, if there, there are certain issues which uh, none, none of the four of us have actually addressed, which you feel were really sort of important, which came out in the conversations during the conference, and which you would want to share actually with everybody. I think it would be really great. Right. If we do have a volunteer from the audience, <laughs> so we can start the discussion. I, I volunteered uh, before I received your question. So, so uh, I apologize if I don't really address it directly. Um, but uh, listening to your comments uh, made me think about, so uh, there's, there's a, a literature in sort of development, uh, development studies that looks at the question of, um, of ethnic heterogeneity in societies. So if you look in sub-Saharan Africa, and it, it, the, the traditional uh, perspective is that uh, diversity is a liability that societies that were more culturally diverse have had greater difficulties with economic growth, uh, et cetera. But I think uh, in the developed world, if you look around and ask yourself, where are the most dynamic uh, parts of the developed world? Uh, if you look, you know, where are the most dynamic, uh, you know, I'm an American, of, of course, so the, the most, the, the most dynamic parts of the United States, the places that are enjoying population growth, the, the places that are enjoying economic growth, uh, are not the most homogeneous places. It is rather the more diverse places. Uh, the discussion about homophobia reminded me, uh, in North Carolina, where I live, uh, there was a lot of news a couple of weeks ago because there was a, a vote to amend the state constitution to ban gay marriage, uh, which was sort of unnecessary because the state already has laws uh, against the practice. But anyway, uh, um, it turns out that, uh, so North Carolina has 100 counties, uh, of which 94 uh, favored the ban on gay marriage. But if you look at the six that opposed it, these are the places that, uh, these, the, the places around Raleigh and Durham and Charlotte, the growing cities, the dynamic cities, the places that have more diversity along a number of dimensions. Uh, and so as the economy globalizes and as, as people need to, uh, it, it, oh, in a global economy, the, the, the spoils go to the people who have experience and a tolerance for dealing with people who are not like themselves. Uh, and if you believe that to be the case, that suggests that there is a possible mechanism for the, the, the growth of tolerance of diversity, which is that if you are not tolerant of diversity, uh, you're not going to make it. So, so maybe that's that's a perspective that uh, that suggests that it, it it might take a while. I mean, so this might be a long run phenomenon. And of course, uh, you know, uh, Keynes said that in the long run we're all dead. So, so you you have to take it with that that grain of salt. But it it does suggest that there is a reversal of this traditional pattern that that 
a tolerance for diversity, or the existence of diversity at one time may have been a liability in some societies, but in a more globalized uh, setting, a tolerance for diversity is, is an asset. <laughs> Right. Uh, sh shall we shall we see if there are other questions? Yes. Then we try to organize. Uh, so, is there any other comments, or remarks from the audience? Yes, please. Thank you. If you want so to mention maybe your name, your affiliation. Yeah, my name is Ulrike Witten. Um, thanks to all speakers. Uh, I have the problem that I can't really challenge you on any point because it was really nice to see the different angles. But at the end of the day criticizing, uh, as Helga put it, uh, quite a lot of papers did already the, the let's say, a static notion of um, nation state mm -hmm. and uh, probably some yeah, more uh, um, familiar with also with this no notion of national, the nationalizing state. So in that sense, I think the problem in Europe, and I mean, we didn't discuss that much uh, about what's the impact of, Europe of Europeanization mm -hmm. on, on the structure of the nation state, for example, but also in terms of shifting uh, symbolic boundaries, for example, because as Marcus said, it's still a fact, let's say, of, of uh, state borders uh, in terms of social welfare. Uh, but nonetheless, what we um, recognize also, have to, to, uh, to take into account, is that increasingly the notion of social welfare also is divided along lines that are racialized, that are uh, aligned to different status of nationality. And uh, yeah, I think that would be an important angle mm -hmm. to discuss, mm -hmm. because my perspective uh, would be more uh, also looking in what ways the collective notion of, of groupings and that sense on multiculturalism is still um, on the table. On the one hand, whereas cosmopolitan identities and subject, subject subjectivity, sorry, um, are really individualized and combined with certain dimensions of privileged social categories. So I think there's a big, big tension between these structures. So I would love to hear more about that. Thank you for your question. Shall we collect another one from the audience beforehand? Uh, on the left there. Then we can... No, could, could you mind, because we are video recording, do you mind using the microphone? Thank you. Yeah, I, my question, it's not well formulated, I think, but I want to pick up from where uh, Helga left off. And this is basically talking about the ethical and political sort of consequences of diversity. And so I'm just wondering, how do you see the, the you know, I'm thinking in terms of, uh, you know, the neoliberal economy. Mm -hmm. And you know, recent, well, it's not so recent, it's almost five years now, right? Um, recession. And it seems to me that multiculturalism and diversity kind of sedates, in a sense, societies. Uh, and it does so partly through the market, right? So we're all one big family of consumers and, you know, wherever you came from, you can, you know, you can consume different commodities in your new environment. And so I'm wondering, where do you see the, the sort of resisting potential of diversity? Uh, so you're a citizen uh, or not, it doesn't matter. You know, you're, you're accepted, your kids are integrated. But what does that mean in terms of uh, organizing, mobilizing a diversified or diverse collective that would, you know, topple neoliberal regimes, right? I mean, because that's... That should be like the next, I mean, I, I don't mean to sign too radical, but it, it seems to me like we have to think about the next step, right? What are the, somebody called it, I think maybe Marco was, called, was talking about the emancipatory potential of diversity. This is part of it, right? Thank you for your question. Then let's uh, go back here to the panelists and have a short answer for. Um, well, one of the things that struck me, uh, was in talking about um, diversity um, being dynamic uh, in so-called developed societies is actually one of the major problems is that it has been problematized by a number of fairly, well, I would say, for me, fairly conservative thinkers, but they would not place themselves on conservative uh, lines. For example, in the UK, David Goodhart, 
a lot of the communitarians is the way that I would put it, who've seen diversity as problematic because what they've argued, and this is a thing that we haven't discussed, is that we have a tendency to share welfare with those that we think are like ourselves and that we don't want to share uh, welfare with those who are different. And it, it's, it's an argument that came up from about mid-2004, 2005, became very, very strong. And I think it's something we need, we certainly need to bear in mind because it's be it is, I think, an argument that is very strongly present um, mm -hmm. in, uh, in terms of how do we look about with whom, with which strangers, basically, yeah do we share our social goods? And I think it's something we haven't discussed because we've discussed multiculturalism. But for me, multiculturalism is largely still about recognition. And I think if we come back to what, you know, Nancy Fraser's uh, discussion <coughs> of distribution and recognition, it's how, and that was, you know, the difficulty is how to bring them together. And I don't think multiculturalism does give us an answer to neoliberalism, frankly. I really don't think it is, you know, necessarily the answer to it. Because I think the question is, a lot of the literature, for example, on hospitality is raising the question of with, with which strangers are we prepared to share our home, meaning the nation, but also our social resources. And I think this is very important. Um, and in fact, on Europeanization, that's been pushing more and more towards neoliberalism, if we think about it, because what, what Europeanization has been doing is to put strictures on how much debt you can have and what do we see in a lot of European countries. So I think that, and my final point here before I pass on uh, to Helga, is um, the question of cosmopolitanism, again, which I think has been missing. Uh, to some extent uh, in our discussions. And there are a myriad ways of thinking about cosmopolitanism which go from the consumerist, what I would call a consumer cosmopolitanism, which is kind of about how do you consume difference um, as, a as opposed to live with difference. And I think those two things are not the same. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> indeed, as you mentioned, uh, uh, among uh, neoliberal, and I come back to neoliberalism, but I'll, I'll elaborate a bit. Uh, for neoliberal um, politicians, economists, uh, really diversity is seen as providing an economic advantage. And this is actually sort of very, very dominant thinking. And uh, a number of scholars, for example, have uh, written about this. The way it is seen to providing an advantage is actually the, the uh, the secret is that you really can commodify diversity. You can commodify cultures. It is through this that actually you also uh, actually get, gain an economic advantage. For example, I think it was not Kruger. Um, I don't know. I don't remember his name. Actually, sort of a uh, business person. Who, he wrote about it. How it is that the inner city, if uh, and the sort of uh, ethnic concentrations, minority concentration in cities, all what needs to be done to try to turn around these places is to actually that they really learn how to commodify actually their cultures and their diversity and this actually will help actually revitalize the area. Now however um, so in a way I think a very important component is the way diversity thought about in neoliberalism is actually as a commodity. Uh, culture as a commodity uh, and only those, those, those actually diversity which is valued is those which uh, those differences which can be... Uh, but that's banal cosmopolitanism, yeah. basically. Oh, I see, okay. Yes, we're talking about the same okay. thing. But, but I think, actually, it is interesting because it has been very influential. I, some of you might know the book by uh, Richard Florida, The Creative Class, and that's what it's all about. You know, It's all about how we actually can uh, cash in and, and, and uh, on diversity. Um, in terms of your question, great question, uh, the ethical uh, uh, in um, what the question was where is the resisted potential and it's actually absolutely amazing uh, I, also for me who has been studying actually sort of activism in particular reg uh, with regards to sort of immigrants and immigration and immigrant advocacy for a long time in the United States really the resisting potential actually comes uh, out of the immigrant community and often actually undocumented immigrants in alliance with a variety of different uh, community civic organizations, churches, labor unions, tenant organizations. Uh, and it's there where actually really the resisting, I would argue, 
the main resisting potential lies, uh, which is it's this these alliances, uh, which some people actually already have referred to as sort of the immigrant rights movement in the United States, uh, which is challenging. Uh, let's see the representation of immigrants as simply being a, a burden on the state, the representation of immigrants, of taking jobs away, and also, in a way, uh, trying to, step by step, really provide counter-arguments and counter-discourses uh, against sort of dominant discourses about uh, sort of the, and the immigrants being a burden, but also actually challenging, for example, these exclusionary policies which I mentioned, challenging them in the courts, on the streets, you know, uh, and uh, uh, interestingly now actually scaling up, also uh, act, being, becoming active at the uh, national level but also at the international level. So I found out recently that some of these local immigrant organizations are now joining forces with some people in the United Nations. So uh, it's nothing about overthrowing anything but it's, it's absolutely, I, I think, something we should take serious, incremental, uh, in, uh, tenacious, actually contestations on the ground and uh, as, as part of organized collective action. But I think what is also interesting, and I'm really interested in the relationship here, uh, part of it is we don't just see organized collective action, we also see everyday forms of resistance. And often they actually go together. So for example, foot dragging and all different kinds of sort of strategies you know, in the everyday, which people use to basically resist uh, regimes. Thank you. Let's open the floor for another round of questions. Uh, so first up. Thank you. Um, my observation is that uh, debating the discourse on multiculturalism and diversity in developed countries like United States, a United Kingdom with more prosperous economy um, might look simple and um, something that is a bit settled, even though it's still important to, di to discuss and debate the issue further. Where I'm coming from now is the consideration of multiculturalism and diversity in countries experiencing transition those that are not settled. Because I can say United Kingdom is settled, United States settled, but we are talking about, for instance, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. that are inherently multicultural, mm -hmm. not as a result of just migration, mm -hmm. but because yeah. of the, right. uh, the, the, um, the configuration of the, the various nation states. What, what do you think that are the implications? Do you Actually, the question is for everyone. Um, do, do, do you actually prescribe or suggest multiculturalism as a way forward in sub-Saharan Africa, taking into consideration the latest baby of United Nations is South Sudan? And we know the history. I mean, I want you to respond to that. Is it desirable in developing and uh, countries in transition? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Let's move here. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Evans Fanoulis, Essex University. Um, I would like to uh, make two comments that are related uh, to issues that I think that have not been that much developed during the conference. So the first one refers to the issue of democracy that has not been discussed that much. And I was wondering, when it comes to, uh, to multiculturalism, in your opinion, and it's... Uh, question for all of you. Mm. What model of democratic governance you think is more, uh, is more compatible with the issue of multiculturalism and can protect, well, let's, let us say it's more hospitable towards a multiculturalism. And the second one is the issue of, uh, maybe it's a follow-up question when it comes to the issue of Europeanizations about the European, European integration project, okay? Because uh, there is uh, quite a lot of ink has been already spilled on the issue of European citizenship and the issue of European identity. And I was wondering whether, you, in your opinion, you think the, the issue of European identity stand, stands at odds with the issue of multiculturalism, 
and whether there is the, this gap can be uh, by any way breached. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Another question here, and then we can start answering here. First, uh, here. Thank you. Um, I, I should begin by saying that um, I've, I've learned a tremendous amount from Sorry, both Eleanor. The I Sorry, think you better open? put the mic on. <laughs> is he open? Is Christina, on? can you check, please? Okay. Then maybe it is on. Uh, oh. Well, I was going to say that I've learned a tremendous amount from Eleanor and Jill over the years' um, work. Um, and what I'm about to say is shouldn't be conceived as at all critical. Um, but I did... I think you'll see it's not critical. I, I hope you do, no, anyway. No, it's fine. Um, but I did notice that there was a very cautious endorsement of ideas of nationhood and perhaps even an ambivalence on the subject. Um, perhaps it was used deliberately. Uh -huh. And I wondered whether or not you, any of you would accept, this is directed to any of you, um, I wondered whether or not you would accept that ideas of nationhood have had a, a very rich history of excluding minorities. Mm -hmm. And that's why nationhood becomes very important to minorities. Enoch Powell, a right-wing politician in Britain, used to say that Commonwealth migrants, they can be citizens, but they can't be members of the nation. It becomes a very, a very important source. If you can usurp that, it becomes a way of including migrants and their descendants within the polity. And thus it serves a real psychological use for minorities. And there are good social psychological studies that show this as well. Henri Tajfal's work is the obvious thing to cite here. But also there's a practical use when we think about what citizens have to do for one another, they have to trust one another to obey the law, trust one another not to be free riders, make sacrifices for one another, like delaying their demands, so the more urgent ones of others can be met, pay taxes that provide public services that they may not use. <coughs> citizens have to do a lot for one another. They have to trust and make sacrifices for one another. Historically, ideas of nationhood Help to, cultivate, help to cultivate the necessary unity that enables people to trust and make sacrifices for one another. As soon as you then accept these points, then we say, well, look, nationhood has been very important, not only now for minorities, but for the societies in which we generally live in. And I wondered whether or not you'd accept that, and whether or not that has then implications for the more cautious and ambivalent possibly ambivalent endorsement of nationhood that in different ways you all offered when you were making your comments. And that, that means I'm going to be attacked by all four of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So shall we, each of you, you want to start, Patricia? Sure. Since I said out the last one, let's start. Um, great questions, tough ones. Um, one thing that maybe we haven't fully done during the last two days also is to actually define what we mean by multiculturalism. So we're operating with a variety of definitions here with your paper yesterday, um, a number of other papers. So, so what, what is, it, is it that we mean is multiculturalism? And if I'm going to ask each and every one of you. I'm probably going to get um, a lot of different <laughs> answers here. So whatever I'm going to say now, <laughs> take it um, as, as my understanding of multiculturalism, which comes out of an understanding of multiculturalism as something that was, in, in the German context, a notion of anti-racism, um, even though Germans don't like to talk about racism, they talk about xenophobia, which is also, so terms translate in, in a number of different ways. We talked about that a little bit earlier today. So I'm wondering about your question about South Sudan. So the question, is it about um, 
whether or not we should force people to stay in the same mm -hmm. state when they can't get along and they're going to kill each other. Or um, in, in this particular case, in a number of other cases um, where we've seen states break up, Yugoslavia is an example that a number of people brought up over um, the past few days. So the question is under what conditions and circumstances, and that goes back to your question of whether or not the nation is a uniting um, factor. Here comes my ambivalence. Should we stay together at all? Um, so cost and, and cost of human life. And so I don't have an answer, so I'm just throwing the questions back at you. Um, whew, got out of that one. No, <laughs> <laughs> sort of. <laughs> um, the question of democracy is a good one. <laughs> and it's one in which I have come to think of democracy as something that's influenced by um, Derrida's caution that it is not yet there and that democracy tends to have uh, great talents as, at destroying itself in the name of preserving it. So a notion of um, thinking, which uh, is, an, is a problem. So what I mean by that then is, is whether or not in the name of preserving, say, national unity and, and, and democratic participation, do we give everybody the same voice? Do we accept that certain people advocate a particular way of um, uh, expressions of ideas that are going to curtail other people's um, everyday lives? Um, religious freedom is, is one of those issues, but um, women's right to wear or not wear a burqa or headscarf, um, building minarets in Switzerland, all of these are questions. And, and in the name of democracy and in the name of preserving religious freedoms and preserving religious rights, very often the opposite is, is happening. So um, what I like to think of as the way I think then about democracy is something that is not finished. So that's something in which emergence it is one of the defining characteristics. So I wouldn't want to, again, go into a static notion of what that is. A bit of butter. And I think I will leave it at that because there's three more people who right. have lots to say. Okay, to be quick. Okay, um, just to say, uh, I think, again, there's a whole series of different kinds of multiculturalisms. Um, the sub-Saharan, sort of the Sudanese case, is, is I think, um, as Patricia has said, it's a question of are we talking about states, uh, p groups staying together within a state as opposed to splitting apart? Because there's a question of multiculturalism as just fluid identities, which are fairly loose and have very few, little implication for group rights, as opposed to very differential rights, which are embedded in, a, for example, a constitution, or not in a constitution, but simply in the force, in actual force. So I think that there's a, we haven't really looked at the range of multiculturalisms and the meanings, uh, you know, in a political sense, and um, in the two-day conference, because we've mainly really looked at sort of European North American, yes. to be honest. And I think there's a huge question that we need to, we would have to have another kind of conference and add on. But, uh, but in the European case, there have been, as in ex-Yugoslavia and elsewhere, um, uh, areas where there's been total asundering going on. So I think that's, we, we need to think about that. Um, I don't think there's a single model of, for multiculturalism anyhow, however, because it, again, it differs from one state to another. And I don't think there's a single democrat, you know, democratic model which enshrines it. In terms of European integration, um, as we know, uh, you don't have European citizenship without having the, and that's been one of the critiques, is European citizenship itself is a secondary kind of citizenship dependent on being the citizen of a nation state. And just having their said here, uh, the question about nationhood, there's a lot of slippage going on between nation, nationhood, nation state. We shouldn't forget that. Um, and I would actually point out that citizenship can be very instrumental. Uh, we've been talking about it with uh, colleagues here, and that fact in the UK, only 1% of the Irish actually bother to have British citizenship. So we can't talk about, well, if, as a citizen, you get this and you don't get that. There are plenty of people with permanent residence in all of these countries who act 
possibly like citizens or you know who participate in a society um, not necessarily in the nationhood and not as citizens but they kind of nevertheless participate and I think there's been a lot of discussion in political theory about you know participating without being a citizen um, I better stop to let my others yeah great questions amazing big questions great questions uh, in terms of your uh, question about um, how do we think about it? Is this, these discussions about multiculturalism and multicultural nation of any value for countries in the global south, in particular sub-Saharan Africa? And sort of a, a first jerk sort of reaction would have been, yeah, why not? But then you said Sudan, and then of yeah. course everything exploded. Yeah. Because then I thought, okay, so before we do this, we need to think about it. Who actually uh, uh, made the boundaries? Which actually created these sort of multinational, you know, multicultural, you know, and multinational states. So in a way, I think uh, I would argue we need to have another conference to to ask actually what would it mean if we actually look at seeing from the south. If we see, if we look at multiculturalism from the south, and uh, I think it's not that we can just we we should throw out what we have sort of talked about and what we know, but I think it absolutely. We can't just say, okay, here we know, we know how it works, and we'll just sort of transfer it. So uh, that would be my uh, response to your question. In terms of democracy, uh, great question. I think the way um, it has been generally, many people have talked about it, how multiculturalism fits into liberal democracy or into neoliberal democracies, is that in the case of or advanced liberal democracies, is that you say, okay, we'll just create special rights collective rights, as opposed to liberal democracies about individual rights, but we, we create group rights uh, for different sort of cultural groups. That is sort of one solution which has been really promoted. Now, I would argue that if you look at the ideas uh, which are coming out from the, from, from the grassroots, for example, in the US, from the immigrant rights movement, they have much more in common in terms of, in terms of vision of democracy, which is more like actually a radical democratic vision, which uh, uh, sort of resembles more what actually sort of Iris Marian Young, some of the political philosopher Iris Marian Young, or uh, Chantal Mouffe for that matter, actually proposed. So there's different ways of thinking, but it's really an important thing really to explore. So very, it's very good that you asked the question. How useful is multiculturalism in the context of uh, the global south? I mean, I, I think that we need to uh, get away from the classic kind of, you know, opposing Western ideas about thinking of selfhood and collectivity from other parts of the world. And I'm really interested in um, the reverse, how we might, uh, in the, the global north, learn from, um, from different ways of thinking about difference and, um, uh, and tackling questions of difference in the global south. And the project I mentioned before, where I was doing work, the African Communion, there, um, you know, I was interested in different African notions of uh, selfhood and different notions of collectivity and traditions in, in you know, Uganda and, and South Africa, of, um, you know, a very different collective way of thinking, uh, as opposed to the, the kind of Western focus on individualism. And the African Communion has been trying to use um, Zulu uh, ideas. Um, I forget, I've got terrible. Age, uh, loss. I forget <laughs> the name of the concept, so hopefully so you, you may be able to help me out, somebody else will be able to help me out. But um, in trying to bring together the Anglican communion, they're using this Zulu notion of, um, uh, of bringing people together, which is based on... Indaba. Indaba, thank you. Yes, that's what, that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, bring people, I was just going to look um, it. Bring people okay. together, yeah, and they're doing, and they've been rolling out a programme of bringing hmm. people from different contexts, both in the global south and the north together, in different places and having this notion of getting people to sit around and, and, and debate and discuss the issues until they can reach some kind of collective agreement. I'm not, apologies, it's late, I've not articulated that very well, but I'm very interested in, in those kind of models of thinking about um, a difference rather than, you know, stuck in the Western model of multiculturalism. Uh, ambivalent about uh, nationhood. Um, <laughs> Yes, the notion of the nation can be important to minorities, but I've done work with Somali refugee and asylum seekers in the UK and Denmark, and you know, it's a classic academic answer, it was always more complex than that. So um, the Somalis who were 
uh, in Denmark um, because of the way the Danish state had practiced the notions of integration had um, uh, been uh, had, had language uh, classes um, and language testing prior to what subsequently being introduced in the UK, and they had a policy of trying to disperse people and not allowing them to form communities. And so those for those Somalis, um, being Danish was really important to them. Um, and you know they often many of them spoke Danish at home rather than Somali at home, and they had uh, and being part of the nation was important to them. While on the other hand, they also experienced a lot of prejudice and never felt they could see not belonged because they were always referred to as a stranger or a foreigner. In the UK, there hadn't been at that time anyway the same kind of um, integration policies, and maybe the Somalis uh, settled in um, Muslim communities, both the strong mm. Somali presence already, but also with um, Pakistani and, uh, and other Muslim communities. And for those groups, um, their sense of um, belonging wasn't to the UK, they were less concerned about Britishness, but then their sense of belonging attachment was both rooted in the local place and being part of uh, the local Somali or broader Muslim community, and was also shaped through their transnational relationships. So I think um, the extent to which the nation is important, and the nation who is important to minority groups is quite complex and needs to be understood in, you know, in those contexts of what the nation means. Uh, and then thirdly, the issue of European citizenship, um, probably is not the question either, but um, the research I've been doing uh, about um, you know, the difference has been recognising that there are different kinds of European society, and our research is both based in the UK and in Poland, recognising that um, you know there is both the UK, like France and the Netherlands, and so on, have a colonial history and a very particular um, history in the way, ways of dealing with questions of multiculturalism and difference versus um, uh, societies, particularly those in uh, in the East, where obviously they have a long history of um, diversity and difference, but where the period of communism certainly created a temporary period of homogeneity. Um, and, and trying to understand the, the different um, uh, the different ways, therefore, the issues about difference are played out and people's different embracing a lot of European equality legislation uh, and also some relationships between them, those two places. I think I've got things to say. <laughs> uh, it's time to say goodbye. <laughs> uh, thank you very much again, and uh, we will remain in contact. Uh, there is no planned event or dinner tonight, but more informally, maybe you can get together with a... Uh, unfortunately, we'll have to take off, but um, thank you again, everybody, on my behalf and Tatiana's. Well. Thank you.